So should we start? Yes, sir. Good evening, friends. Uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, the slight technical uh, hitch sometimes can happen. So today is uh, the next uh, of the case webinars. Uh, we are having case-based discussions in critical care medicine. And today, again, uh, it's from Gangaram Hospital, courtesy Dr. Atul Gogia, sir who has been actively contributing. And uh, it'll be presented by Dr. Shipra Bulati. She is senior resident department of internal medicine, Gangaram Hospital. And Dr. Gatul Gogia, you all know, is a senior consultant and very much involved in the academics there and in our programs in internal medicine. And uh, joining us for the discussions, uh, Dr. Nikhilesh Jain, uh, sir, is uh, Director of Critical Care Services and of the Administration at CHL Hospital Indore, the largest hospital at Indore. And uh, we have Dr. Ritu Singh again with us. I mentioned this earlier also. She is Assistant Professor at IGMS Medical College, Patna. So let's uh, look forward to an interactive discussion and teaching. And uh, more focus is towards the acute medicine part of critical care rather than, you know, the usual things we discuss in critical care so that you people can, you know, get some message and some information and how to approach these cases from a medical point of view. So I hand it over to you, Dr. Shipra, to start the proceedings. Okay, so thank you, sir. You have to go full screen. Yes, sir, I'm just doing that. Can I start? Yeah, please. Yeah. So we're presenting the case breathing trouble diagnostic double. A 69-year-old male, pharma by occupation with no comorbidities, presented with complaints of dry cough with dull aching, non-radiating chest pain on the left side since 20 days, low-grade fever on and off since 10 days. He also had a strip shortness of breath which progressed from MMRC grade 2 to MMRC grade 4 over a period of 12 to 15 days. On the presentation, he was admitted to the medicine HDU. There was no history of sore throat, diarrhea, burning, micturation, altered sensorium, no obvious bleeding from any site, no history of orthopnea or palpitations. He gave history of COVID infection in the month of August 2020. He was a non-alcoholic. He had past history of smoking but had left since 5 years. He also gave history of weight loss of approximately 3 kgs in the past 2 months. Bladder and bowel habits were normal. So, so can we just go back to the history of the shepherd? One thing I would like to know is, was he on any medications? No, so he was not on any medications. So, uh, pr prior to admission... Roshapra, he was not on any medications? No sir. no, sir. He was not on any medications in the past. Okay. So, and uh, about this COVID, was he on the ventilator or it was just a minor infection? It was a minor infection, sir. Okay. So, he, I mean, as, uh, you, did you get the issue? Was, did he require NIV support or anything like that? No. Yeah, he had a moderate COVID and he was managed at home. Um, and but he required uh, steroid and oxygen support. Uh, intermittently, he was uh, on oxygen at home, but uh, not uh, on any high flow oxygen. But intermittently, probably that time uh, he required a little bit of oxygen. But majoritily, he was off oxygen. Not didn't require long term oxygen or anything, but just required short course of steroid because he has he had. Uh, borderline hypoxia and uh, persistent fever. So, sir, steroid was stopped two, three months ago, I believe at least. He was off steroids. 
from what our history was available it was probably a few weeks couple of weeks okay so for a few months he has taken steroid that means for months at least couple of weeks no no he got covid in august so he, when, yeah, yeah. when is the patient so, so for couple of weeks only he required steroid so last one month or so he was not on steroid right not on steroid any history of copd admissions in the past or breathing difficulties such as copd none okay so uh, just go back to the previous slide dr shubhra now we have this patient here who is a farmer and uh, there is no relevant past history except that in august he had some covid requiring oxygen he was on steroids so it was my moderate covid at least and uh, as presumably we don't have any cities or x rays from that time so he has now uh, cough and chest pain on the left side and uh, low grade fever and progressive shortness of breath for the last 2 to 3 weeks i have a question sir yeah yeah uh, uh, in the previous covid uh, did he have any history of anticoagulants uh, he was not admitted but at uh, home maybe he was on anticoagulant no not sure as per the he no, didn't sir. have any records so not records sure. okay sir okay sir. so uh, now if you were to analyze the history uh, dr ritu you would like to comment on this chest pain possible causes would could be there for chest pain on the left side for the last two or three weeks uh, there can be huge lot of differential just based on history alone Yeah, we got uh, basically a fever which has been low grade on and off since ten days. Even though history is unreliable, we take that uh, as uh, the dictum here, and uh, we are talking of a fever which was preceded by cough with dull aching, non radiating chest pain on left side. Now, a uh, lot of other things can come into picture. You can have cardiac causes, you can have esophageal, uh, you know, ruptures and everything coming in, and shortness of breath which has called, which has become progressive. From grade two to grade four, so probably one thing I would like to rule out a cardiac cause straight away, and uh, then uh, probably take on it any further. Yes. So uh, the chest pain on the left side is uh, actually pointed towards uh, cardiac etiology, and uh, the only thing is he is also having a dry cough. Yes. You can, can have in uh, cardiac patients. But generally, it is when they lie down. You know, it's like a pro pro proximal nocturnal dyspnea kind of a thing. Yeah, more of that. The only thing is, there's been a progression. So, yes. whether there's been something in evolution from that point in time, so it would be one cause out of the way, and then we can focus purely on the respiratory part of it. Yes, yes, I agree with you completely that with pain on the left side and fever plus minus and progressive dyspnea, he might be. Going towards uh, some kind of a coronary artery disease and developing uh, congestive heart failure, or you know even uh, sometimes viral myocarditis can also have this kind of a picture. But uh, at the same time, not only to what else can cause chest pain on the left side in this patient? Would you like to comment? Uh, yes, as sir said, it could be esophageal also. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to comment uh, that since the patient is having chest pain and dull aching pain and previous history of uh, COVID. so maybe vascular complications of covid 19 could be a possibility uh, the previous uh, history he was not an anticoagulant yet that therapy is unknown and he was having moderate uh, covid uh, covid 19 as per history so that could be a possibility uh, you mean in the sense of uh, pulmonary embolism yes microvascular pulmonary embolism could be yeah pulmonary embolism is always a possibility but you know actually the pain is going on for the last uh, 20 days so in pulmonary embolism the will be sudden normally it is due to the pulmonary infarction involving the pleura you will get pleuritis so you know it would be an acute pain acute shortness of breath so slightly unusual and also the duration you know it's been 6 months since uh, covid so a little unlikely so one is pulmonary embolism one is cardiac then sub massive pulmonary embolism would be more of my differential than a massive pulmonary embolism okay so uh, esophageal likely because you know there yeah. are other things esophageal is just chest pain but pneumonia occurring and the cough occurring and fever occurring uh, esophageal would be less likely would you like to consider a pneumothorax here 
considering that he had COVID and uh, in the past. Could this be a pneumothorax expansion of Victor? Could be a possibility because he's having dry cuff, which is non-radiating and a chest pain is there. So it could be a possibility, pneumothorax could be a possibility, but I feel it, it will be more acute and uh, yes, the absolutely. period of 20 days uh, would be yes. not uh, pointing that, towards uh, that pneumothorax. That is correct. Again, uh, pneumothorax, acute chest pain, acute shortness of breath, the history is not consistent. Then uh, I think uh, a current and a practical uh, solution here is that he's having dry cough. And you know, when the cough is bad in these patients, they start getting pain because of soreness of the muscles. That is something which we don't take. That is very common. A patient who has persistent cough, because he keeps coughing, you know, the, the muscles become sore and they start getting chest pain. So that also may be possible. Apart from that, it is also possible that he has a pleural effusion of some kind and uh, pleurisy with pleural effusion, which is causing left chest pain. So <laughs> that was about the chest pain. So those are the differentials that we can consider for the left-sided chest pain. Now, fever is uh, there. Fever may be infectious, non-infectious. How bad the fever is, we have to see. Then moving on to shortness of breath. So when we have a patient with shortness of breath, Dr. Niklesh, what systems do we like to consider overall, generally? Basically, primarily, as I told you before, first would be cardiac and second thing would be respiratory. So uh, any, any other uh, uh, you know, systems you would think of you know, in general when a patient comes with shortness of breath apart from cardiac and pulmonary? Like probably anemia can, severe anemia can also sometimes contribute to shortness of breath. Yes, but then the duration of onset is just 20 days. If it's a chronic anemia, this patient would have been compensating from quite some time. Ah, that is true, but you know, you, 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 could be, you can be losing blood over the last one month and then you can progress to anemia. Just as a point, you know, you know as pointed towards uh, shortness of breath, if you look at the systems, one is cardiac, like you said, and second is pulmonary, like you said. Then anemia should not be forgotten. Sometimes you have, patients have anemia. And the other uh, thing would be physical inactivity or what do we call physical deconditioning. You know, patient has had COVID and, you know, they are after COVID is fatigue, fatigue and yes. is already depleted. It's something more like a long COVID or a prolonged long COVID. Long post-COVID. Yeah, so physical deconditioning. So overall, uh, I think uh, that would be the analysis of the history. And uh, I think uh, with a dry cough, and uh, chest pain, low grade fever, shortness of breath, all these are pointers towards uh, pulmonary etiology. The cardiac cannot be ruled out and sometimes there is simultaneous cardiac and pulmonary. See on the next slide, Shiprama. So uh, here there is nothing much except that he's been a smoker. There has been no uh, past uh, uh, admissions as far as uh, COPD is concerned, but I think he must have been a smoker for many years. He's 69 years old. He left five years ago and he's a farmer in the rural area. They start smoking at a very early age. So <clears throat> he's... Uh... So there's one significant history on this slide, history of weight loss, approximately three kgs in two months. True. So you want to make any interpretation of that, Dr. Ritu? Yes, uh, probably tubercular could be one of the causes, pulmonary tuberculosis or non-pulmonary tuberculosis could be one of the causes for such an acute weight loss. Yes, definitely. And uh, only thing is, you know, this has to be taken with a pinch of salt. How, how did he know that he had three kg loss in two months? And yes. <laughs> as far as your definition of, you know, significant weight loss is concerned, it's considered as 10% over six months, you know, in medicine generally. So... You are right, there is, there is weight loss and we have to think of it as weight loss. Any other disease you would like to think of as uh, contributing to the weight loss and the, pul and the pulmonary symptoms? So the second could be post-COVID, uh, you know, there's a lot of catabolism that happened in, during COVID. So that could be also one of the uh, reasons. But uh, superimposed tuberculosis, being a farmer... Yes, tuber tuberculosis, post-COVID, but you know, post-COVID... It's, been, it's only lost in the last two months and COVID was six months ago. Anything else, anything else in the lung 
as far as disease is concerned, which can you can start thinking in terms of a you know progressing uh, HIV infection or uh, for secondly a malignancy. Malignancy. These things can be put as a differential for his this particular patient. Yes. Weight loss. Malignancy, absolutely. This is a smoker, 69 years old, with chest symptoms. Malignancy has to be thought of. So, uh, very important. And uh, the other thing is uh, that uh, this thing, uh, the, this entire thing would be an exacerbation of COPD also, with, uh, you know, involving the heart, because they are, they are, uh, he could be having right heart failure, or he could be even having coronary artery disease. He's been a smoker. And uh, that cannot be ruled out altogether. So I think with that, uh, all these possibilities in mind, uh, tuberculosis, cancer, some kind of a non-tubercular infection, and uh, not uh, really ruling out uh, coronary artery disease, we shall move on. So uh, please move on, Dr. Shipra. Dr. Gogi, Gogi sir, would you like to say anything so far? Yeah, yeah. Uh, very interesting discussion has been going on. So I agree with uh, what uh, has been said. Uh, so let's uh, go further and we can take it further. So we've yes. had a uh, discussion like that. Yeah. On examination, the patient was febrile, tachycardic and tachypneic. His BP was 100 by 78 mm of Hg. Saturation was 90% on room air. There was no pallor, ictus, clubbing, sinuses or edema. His generalized appearance was tachexic. On systemic examination in the respiratory system, Bilateral basal trepidations were heard and there was bronchial breath sound heard in the right lower zone. Rest of the systemic examination was normal. His initial blood gas showed a pH of 7.52, PCO2 of 26, PAO2 of 71 and bicarb of uh, 22. Okay, so we just go, we'll just go back there at the examination. <laughs> now, uh, one thing I would like to ask you, Dr. Shipra, this ABG was on room air or on oxygen? So this was on room air, but it appears to be a mixed sample because SAO2 on the ABG is 88. Yes, yes. That is that is uh, one of the problems here. This is this seems to be a mixed sample. But uh, otherwise also, you know, there's a problem with this. Uh, I, this is a mixed sample, so we won't really comment on it. But if you look at it, you know, uh, the pH is 7.52 and the SCO3 is 22. So this this is coming through as acute respiratory alkalosis. But the patient has been dyspneic for quite some time and uh, CO2 is 26. So he should be compensating more. He should, just, he should be going towards chronic respiratory alkalosis. And the bicarb should be, actually be lower. You agree, Dr. Niklesh? That is true, sir. That is true. However, the problem? respiratory yeah. system examination actually sort of nails the respiratory system as the primary culprit. Uh, so, the, the, there's a problem with the ABG, like she has said, his saturation is 88 on this and it's 90 on room air. And uh, this is on, uh, but uh, Dr. Shipra, the saturation, uh, SpO2 is 90 on room air and this ABG is on oxygen? No, sir, on room air. Okay, so there is a discrepancy here, but that much discrepancy can occur. There can be a variation of uh, uh, plus minus 2% between your SpO2 and your ABG SO2. So uh, the, that is all right. So we can't really say this is a mixed sample. This seems to be all right. But the problem here is that he has he's been having, uh, you know, grade 4 dyspnea. And uh, with a grade 4 dyspnea, obviously his uh, acupnic minute ventilation is high and is going on for some time. So PCO2 is 26. Uh, with, once you have a this should be a chronic respiratory alkalosis in terms of compensation okay. and the bicarbonate should be lower. So the bicarbonate is not that low. Uh, are you getting my point, Dr. Shekhil uh, Niklesh? Yes, sir, yes, sir. So, uh, so possible reason for this is that either the bicarb was high initially, you know, so it was something like 26, 27, and it has fallen from there. So that is one explanation I can give to you. Or, you know, he has just developed for the last few hours, he has started hyperventilating. And it is but, or it may, maybe he might be having some additional uh, metabolic acidosis also. Well, Dr. Rituma, if it was acidosis, then bicarb would be lower. And that is what we are trying to say. The bicarb is actually not low enough. That point, I am getting it. Yeah, so... so the, the, the actually, just based on these values, yeah. it would be probably easier to just, just dub it as a respiratory alkalosis. Respiratory alkalosis, yes. 
Yeah, it is acute respiratory alkalosis. Uh, with True. Compensation, acute respiratory alkalosis compensated acutely. The only point I was trying to say was that there should be a chronic compensation in this. Because you've been dyspneic for a long time, so obviously will be hyperventilating for a longer time, as is seen by the PCO2. Dr. Gogia, sir, you would like to say anything to the ABG? That's yeah, yeah. So I agree. Uh, there should be some component of <clears throat> uh bicarb being lower but probably uh what the major concern in this patient was that his uh he was from a middle class background and uh, he came into the hospital uh the main symptom which was more of concern was the breathlessness actually which had pro which was gradually progressive but it probably just at the time when he was coming to the hospital that was the time which uh, his breathlessness had worsened that brought him to the hospital rather than the pain, chest discomfort, <laughs> fever. That was all right. But the main concern why he landed up in the emergency was the acute breathlessness. So probably he had a little bit of an acute component uh, which led to the respiratory alkalosis uh, with a little bit of flare of some uh, infection or uh, uh, a stress. Absolutely. So, so I agree. So he was dyspneic, but probably he was not hyperventilating that much. And over the last few hours, when he has come to the ER, he has gone into hyperventilation, and that is why this is acute, partially compensated, or you know, compensation is only for acute respiratory alkalosis. That would explain it. ECO2 has gone. Acute hyperventilation would be there because he's febrile also right now. Uh, probably at the time of uh, ABG, he was febrile and having high-grade fever. So Yes, yes. That will also contribute to, contribute to it. The, now moving on to the blood pressure. Blood pressure is very interesting. It's 100 by 80. So uh, this is a, you know, this for a person who is 69 years old, this is a low blood pressure overall and there's a low stroke pulse pressure. The pressure as such is low and the pulse pressure is very narrow, it's just 20. So any comments on this, anybody? This blood pressure in a 69 year old man who has come to us. Nothing. So, you know, if I was to look at this, uh, two, three things come to my mind. Uh, one, uh, whether he was having a poor intake, you know, he has been ill for some time, though this is not summer months, but if he has been uh, not uh, taking in enough, it will lead to a hypovolemic kind of a situation. And that will lead to a low stroke volume, one. Second, if he was having any kind of a bleeding somewhere, you know, bleeding is not obvious all the time. So, uh, he is tachycardic also. What was, what was the pulse rate like? Do you remember? No, sir. I don't remember the exact okay. pulse rate. Okay. okay. So uh, the, uh, he could be bleeding, or the third thing is that we have talked about tuberculosis. If tuberculosis is there in the lungs, it could well be there in the adrenal glands also. And adrenal glands uh, patients have a low cardiac output kind of a state and have a narrow pulse pressure, Addison's disease. The fourth one, which I think is the most likely is that he's actually cachectic and the cuff was too big for him. You know, the, the, the cuff, you know, we don't normally change the cuff, but for, for patients who have thin arms or obese arms, the cuff has to change according to the arm size. So like you have mentioned, he's cachectic, he's been losing weight. So probably the cuff was the normal size cuff we use, but it was too big for his arm and thereby you are getting a seriously low blood pressure. So, uh, Dr. Gogia, sir, your comments. I fully agree uh, to your interpretation as always, Dr. Tapesh, but uh, in as I was happening to be seeing the patient, so uh, I think uh, it was more of poor oral intake. Uh, he had uh, probably given a history of 10, 15 days, but I think the fever could have been a little longer and uh, he may not have noticed it that much and his oral intake probably was low and it was a little dehydrated and tachycardic. That was probably the uh, reason for uh, his uh, low blood pressure in this particular case. But rightly, it can be due to uh, all the reasons which you uh, highlighted like 
um, blood loss or renal involvement but generally that would be a little more lower than what this is so i think it was more of dehydration and poor oral intake which uh, has led to the mild uh, uh, hypotension and uh, just to add to the discussion see whenever we call it as a significantly low pulse pressure assuming if our value of systolic bp was 100 then we need to have at least you know something like a uh, one third uh, reduction or at least one fourth or less of the systolic pressure so in this case if your systolic pressure actually the 100 by 78 has been put if it would have been less than 75 then it assumes a clinical significance and there are a lot of other cardiac conditions that may come in such as aortic stenosis tamponade and everything this diverging from the topic so that may be considered if we if we are purely basing it on a clinical examination alone yeah so i think the the, the same point you tend to make that uh, the patient has a low stroke volume which translates yeah. no pulse pressure so that so that is exactly what uh, i was also saying and that is what you were trying to say that a low pulse pressure by definition is anything less than 20 and that reflects upon a low stroke volume and like you said some of the other causes are aortic stenosis or you know you can have cardiac tamponade and so many other cardiac conditions right so uh, uh, even cardiogenic shock for that matter can have a true pressure like this supposing his baseline blood pressure was 130 that itself you know drop of 30 of systolic is a is a pointed towards uh, shock you know the, in the elderly you know the, the blood pressure drops by 30 or 40 systolic it may not have to be lower than 90 just a blood pressure of 100 dropping from 140 is shock but there is no other evidence of shock as such in the sense of uh, cold clammy extremities or altered mentation urine output we do not know so far but Uh, there are no complaints about decrease during out so <clears throat> i think uh, the, the blood pressure doc, like dr gogia said since he is the treating physician was probably due to decreased uh, intake and you know his respiration was high so he was having increased sens- insensible losses he was febrile so again the insensible losses were high now <clears throat> moving on to the respiratory system so dr ritu any comments on the respiratory system examination as per the finding it uh, seems to be some kind of consolidation that is happening in the right lower zone uh, which has got uh, bilateral bas- uh, bronchial breath sounds present in the right lower zone and bilateral crepes so bilateral crepes could be because of uh, left sided atelectasis as well as right sided uh, pneumonia but uh, no not much findings are there so it nails down it to be a respiratory cause only in, according to the findings uh, so <clears throat> Uh, not a neglect anything from your side on the respiratory system anything you want to add no sir nothing at all i think uh, this is fair enough you know you once you've got bronchial breath sounds you've got a tangible evidence that there's some form of pneumonia or some form of uh, pathology in the lung yeah i agree bronchial breath sounds uh, would not occur in uh, uh, this thing uh, uh, any other system but sometimes you know in there's a sign called a watch sign it is seen in uh, patients with cardiac tamponade or large pericardial effusions and you hear it posteriorly you or posteriorly just you know over the uh, heart beside the spine you can hear bronchial breath sound this is called a watch sign due to large uh, pericardial effusions or in situations of cardiac tamponade other than that bronchial breath sounds like uh, our panelists have said generally would mean consolidation but sometimes you can get in cavities also it is then also you can get bronchial breath sounds and bilateral crepes of course uh, could be uh, you know anything and uh, can be cardiac also you should not forget that often in the elderly a respiratory disease precipitates lvf or congestive heart failure and you have two pathologies going on simultaneously so i think uh, we are moving towards a lung pathology and uh, bronchial breath sounds are a pointer towards uh, consolidation or a cavity but at the same time considering their bilateral basal crepes it could also uh, be that there is an element of uh, con- voice is breaking up i think can't hear
So I think, uh, are we moving on? We could not hear you, Dr. Tapesh. Now you are back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I got disconnected just I joined for a minute or so. So I think we have discussed about the lungs and uh, the bronchial breath sounds. So that part was clear. Uh, we have discussed the examination. So let's move on. Moving on to the possible differential diagnosis. So based on the history and findings, our differential diagnosis were as follows. Community acquired pneumonia, then tuberculosis, long COVID, and atypical respiratory infections. Uh, why, why you thought about long COVID? There are tangible lung signs here. So probably long COVID is something that we can actually eliminate from here. So, Dr. Gogia, sir, your, your comments on long COVID. Because you yeah. are the expert on this. No, no. Uh, everybody is an expert. So the thing is that uh, uh, long uh, till the time uh, uh, the findings were setting in, and uh, they were very. Uh, there was definitely signs of respiratory infection. So probably we had a uh, discussion earlier. So I think uh, this patient probably had some amount of underlying bronchiectasis. Uh, a COPD component because he was a smoker, although he did not give any history of using any bronchodilators or any recurrent admissions and all, but probably had some amount of bronchiectasis and along with that signs of respiratory um, uh, infection as by virtue of having bronchial breath sounds. The long COVID thing was there because he had a moderate COVID earlier and although he had bronchial breathing, but uh, there was this... Uh, Thing in mind whether there was some co uh, component of inflammation going on along with that he he has had a secondary infection because uh, in a lot of these patients uh, these days who and I'm sure all of you are seeing is that they are have been receiving steroids they are elderly they're diabetic so there is a flare of a secondary infection in these patients so it could have been a mix and match rather than just isolated long COVID. So probably that is why it uh, it is there in most of the differentials these days who are coming in with uh, a past history of uh, COVID. So what is what is the follow-up uh, on these patients who were there with you, admitted with COVID, lung disease, and now coming to you? Are they resolving or are they worsening? What is your... Okay. So it is very, very interesting. We've had three set of uh, patients. So one set was 2020. So those patients uh, had a moderate to severe course. That was the way when we started in March was the time when we started seeing and admitting patients. So they were generally, uh, majority of them had a, reasonably good course and some component of patients did not, did have extensive lung involvement fibrosis which took a, a long period to recover which took up a, a lot of them recovered but it took a long period they were especially so the second uh, duration that is uh, the way which was the 2021 april may one during that period it was much severe form which we saw they had a lot of lung involvement. They had a lot of fibrosis, interstitial lung disease kind of picture. And a uh, lot of them succumbed to it. But a whole lot of them required home oxygen because despite being in the hospital for over a month, they were requiring some amount of oxygen. But out of that, I would say majority did come out. But obviously, it depended on underlying lung disease if some some of them had an underlying disease some of them are elderly they they had a lot of uh, difficulty in coming out but otherwise majority took six months eight months three months of home oxygen and uh, quite a bit of them have actually come out so so overall the the long-term prognosis is favorable and they're resolving that is what you would like to say yes yes Okay, so that is also what I had, uh, you know, gone through some literature over a period of six months uh, follow-up, you know, in some studies, they have shown that CD findings 
are decreasing and uh, there's resolution of pulmonary symptoms, but uh, further follow-up is still required because we do not have follow-up as far as uh, case studies are, or case series are concerned for 12 months. But the data is showing that uh, things are resolving over a period of time uh, from whatever data is available so far. Now, other thing I would like to just ask uh, is whether there was a possibility of an infection here and precipitating uh, exacerbation of COPD. Because I feel yeah. th there was an element of COPD in this patient. The only 10% of the patients who smoke actually become smokers as far as the statistics are concerned. But I think it is much more than that from what we see. And he must have been a smoker for a long time. I do not know what made him give up, give it up. So the, the point here is, if you look at the ABG, Dr. Shipra, can you just show the ABG? Yes, sir. So now the ABG is, PCO2 is only 26. So now the question is, can you have a acute exacerbation of COPD with a PCO2 of 26? Because we all know that COPD exacerbations are associated with hypercapnia. That is the point I'm trying to make that in COPD also, there are two types of respiratory failure, classic hypercapnic, but occasionally these patients have hypocapnic respiratory failure also, where they tend to hyperventilate and are able to blow out their PCO2. And this happens in early COPD. Once the COPD becomes bad, they are not able to blow out their CO2. But when they are at borderline, because they can, you know, kind of increase their work of breathing and the VEP IQ mismatch is not so much, they can have hypocapnic respiratory failure. So it is also possible that this patient has an infection and has this, uh, you know, hypoxemic kind of a COPD exacerbation. Well, were there any wheezing? No, I don't think so. There was any reason. All right. So uh, I think uh, we should move on then, Dr. Shipra, please. So coming to the investigations. His hemoglobin was 11.7. Total count was 6,530 with 86% of neutrophils. Platelet count was 4.94 lakhs. ESR was raised, which was 65. Uh, sodium and potassium was 136 and 4.21. The uh, blood urea nitrogen was 5.08. Creatinine was 0 0.67. LFTs were within normal limits. Serum calcium was 8.41. HS drop by was less than 1.5. NT pro BNP was 129. Serum procal was normal. Uh, PS for malarial parasite was negative. Dengue NS1, IgM, Leptospira IgM, scrub typhus were all negative. D dimer was 0.65. Urine routine and culture were normal. Blood culture was sterile. 2D echo was normal. And TB contiferon gold was negative. So let's just go back. So uh, here, you know, uh, the, the remarkable uh, features are one, that PLC is normal, but there is a shift towards neutrophilia. So this itself is uh, indicative of neutrophilia. You know, even if you have a TLC, which is normal, uh, a neutrophil count of more than 90% uh, has the, almost the same connotation as uh, elevated TLC with uh, neutrophilia. Then the other thing is sodium and potassium. So if uh, there was tuberculosis and if there was some degree of adrenal involvement leading to Addison's, you would be getting hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. So not seen in all, but uh, that is again uh, against any adrenal involvement uh, because we were discussing that in the blood pressure and there was a possibility of tuberculosis. The other thing is urea is low. So in these patients who, you know, uh, who are not eating well and who are going into a malnutrition kind of a thing, the urea becomes low because urea comes from uh, protein and if the protein intake is not too good, uh, you get a low urea. Then <laughs> moving on to anti pro BNP, that is against a cardiac involvement, I believe, because I actually use BNP, but I think this anti pro BNP has to be 
more than 900 to suggest uh, cardiac uh, involvement, you know, CHF. And uh, HS tropi, again, I think I would uh, ask Dr. Uh, Gogia to interpret because I've been used to tropi, though I think HS tropi is much more sensitive and is coming into vogue. Then uh, I think there's nothing much. What about uh, dengue, lepto, or scrub causing any of this? Uh, Dr. Nikhilesh or Dr. Ritu, you would like to comment? Is it possible? Yeah, yeah, sir, in my opinion, when I go through this, the entire set of investigations, there are uh, two or three outstanding features. If one, uh, total count is normal, even though uh, you've got neutrophils of 86%, then you've got an ESR of 65, you've got a normal eco and uh, insignificant antiprobian B along with the insignificant prokaryote. So along with that, and you've got a TB quantifier on gold, which is negative. So probably community acquired pneumonia, one. Secondly, uh, possible atypical pneumonia because of the way his total counts and the rest of the things and the dengue, lepto, and scrub have behaved. And uh, the only uh, other thing is there was a differential of TB put. Uh, at least acute phase is definitely not there, TB quantifier on gold, uh, even though the ESR is slightly high. So that is what my interpretation would be. So... Dr. Uh, Ritu, ma'am, you like to add anything from the uh, investigation? No, no, I agree with Dr. Nikolesh Jain. Uh, okay. Cardiac is ruled out for sure from the investigations and uh, it it points towards pneumonia, well, a pulmonary cause only. So, but uh, can it be scrub typhus? Scrub typhus, uh, thrombocytopenia is not there. Fever with thrombocytopenia is the usual uh, differential of, uh, we go for the differential. So scrub could unlikely present like this uh, but because we do not have any history of SCAR also in this. And uh, so I don't think scrub and lepto would, uh, 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 renal involvement and cephalopathy is not there. So uh, I don't uh, think that it will be because of scrub and lepto. Yes, I think I agree with you. Uh, and the other thing is, history is very prolonged. You know, it's, it's uh, started with chest pain, cough. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's less acute. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Gogia, sir, your comments on quantiferon, TB quantiferon gold, if you would like to elaborate. So, that is one of the tests which is uh, being done uh, quite frequently. I actually do not, but yeah, my, I have a big team, so a lot of people like to do this test and that probably that's the reason it was done. Uh, actually, uh, it is a test, as all of us are aware, which is just a pointer to exposure or a latent TB rather than an active TB. And so there are a lot of fallacies associated with so some elderly people, people who are having immunosuppressed. So those may not be having IGRA positive or a TB quantiferon gold positive. And again, uh, positivity would not make me think for sure that this is tuberculosis. So I generally place this test in a setting where I want to rule out a latent TB and I want to use immunosuppressive therapy in my patient. This is that set of patient generally. Uh, the test is done because we have seen a whole lot of time when We've had patients who are sputum positive and they are quantiferon negative and we've seen patients who have no evidence of active TB and uh, quantiferon gold being positive. So it has its own limitations and it has only, as I feel, to be used in a setting where you want to rule out actually latent TB rather than an active TB. That's what I feel. Okay, sir. So, so I think uh, from the investigations, uh, uh, we are thinking of uh, some kind of an atypical infection in the lungs uh, and uh, let us see what it turns out to be. So please move on. His chest x-ray showed bilateral lower zone haziness, right more than the left. HRCT chest was done which showed extensive tree in bud nodular infiltrates, few cavitatory and few coalescing to form a small consolidation in both lungs, more in the lower zone. Emphysematous changes, hyperdense talcific mediastinal lymph nodes up to 1.2 centimeters. So this is how his X-ray chest looked like. So, so we just hold it there and have a look at the X-ray.
So if I was to not do anything shocking for you in this, what what do you anything majorly abnormal in this for you? Excuse me. So, Dr. Nikhilesh, you like any comments on the X-ray? Anything glaringly abnormal or anything? Yes, extensive bilateral reticular uh, pattern is seen on uh, both the lungs, middle as well as the right uh, lower lungs. So there is a reticular pattern and it is actually more towards reticular nodular also. Reticular. It is not a classic fluffy shadow kind of a picture airspace classification that we see with bacterial pneumonias. So this kind of a reticular nodular shadow you can get in atypical pneumonias. Or also, this could be a sequelae of COVID. You know, if you had COVID in the past, uh, X-ray is known to persist with COVID. So we are not sure of what exactly is happening. And uh, <clears throat> there is a reticular nodular bilateral infiltrative disorder on the X-ray, and the left CP angle is not clear. The left CP angle is not clear. Neither is the cardiac uh, salute over the left diaphragm clear. So that means there's probably some opacification in, in the left lower lobe and there are a lot of uh, reticular shadows, retrocardiac, if you can make out. And other thing is the x-ray is overexposed as you can see the entire spine. And that may be because he's cachectic so the penetration was not existed. But other than that, the quality of the x-ray is very good. There is no rotation as such in the X-ray. So that is uh, the way I'm looking at it. And it's possible there are some cavities on the X-ray. They seem to be uh, some small, small, actually bronchitic kind of a uh, picture. Small, small cavities and cysts are there on the X-ray from what I can make out. So <clears throat> that is the comment on the X-ray. What is, what is the X-ray report say? And what is the CT report say? The X-ray showed bilateral lower zone haziness, right modern left, and HRCT showed uh, extensive train bud nodular infiltrates, few cavitatory and few coalescing to form small consolidation in the both lungs, more in the lower lobes, emphysematous changes, along with hyperdense calcific mediastinal lymph nodes up to 1.2 mm or uh, 1.2 centimeter. Right, ma'am. So let's move. On. So now we have some CT images. So, uh, do you have a close-up of this? Yeah. So actually, uh, one can see some cavities, but they are looking more like, you know, bulla or systemy, since they don't seem to be having a very prominent uh, wall around them. I think Atul sir uh, would be the best person to explain this to us. Sorry? I think Atul sir would be the best person to explain this to us. Yes. Okay. Dr. Gogia sir, please. Yeah, so uh, so as uh, as the X-ray was discussed rightly, there were bilateral reticular nodular shadows which were being seen on both the sides with some amount of lower lobe uh, consolidation. Maybe some minimal effusion could have been there. Next, uh, Shipra, just move on to the CT in the next. And in this section, if you see, uh, there were extensive uh, emphysematous changes that we discussed with the radiologist as well. And there was emphysematous changes as was expected because he being a smoker. And he had these uh, confluent uh, lesions on both sides. And uh, as what you uh, rightly were saying, which is cavitation or probably one or there could be an end on bronchus, which we are seeing. Uh, but uh, definitely there was uh, some amount of uh, small amount of cavitation also visible with uh, the reticular nodular shadows shadows there and a tree in bud which is supposed to be seen in whole quite a lot of things but quite uh, predominantly being uh, thought of synonymous with tuberculosis uh, in our scenario so so that was the kind of uh, description uh, from this uh, ct which after discussion with the radiologist and taking the history into consideration so, so finally, in a, in a nutshell, what is the CT diagnosis? 
So CT diagnosis was that there is extensive bilateral reticular nodule shadows with an underlying emphysematous lung. So probable uh, was an infective histology, most likely tuberculosis. But there seems to be a, a patch of consolidation also in the right zone. Yeah, there seems to be a patch of consolidation there, which uh, probably they felt could be a part of uh, the tuberculosis only. And, and the cystic shadow, that, that is bulla or what, what was that supposed to be? No, that no, no. Cavity? The cystic shadow, as I saw, uh, uh, it is not clear. In all, obviously, we don't have all the sections here, okay. but uh, there was probably... This is an end on bronchus also, which is quite uh, looking like a, uh, a bulla or a cavity here. Right. So please move on, Dr. Shipra. Yeah, is Sianka and Pianka were negative? Anti HIV, HBS, AG, and anti HCV were negative. CRP was 56. An ultrasound of the abdomen showed grade 1 fatty liver. Rest of it was normal study. Uh, Dr. I think uh, the differentials are towards an infection. And uh, I don't know, Dr. Ritu, you want to comment anything about Dr. Niklesha? So, so I think we should discuss a few, a uh, little bit more about uh, uh, what are the differentials of a tree in a bud uh, appearance on a CT scan. So, tuberculosis sarcoidosis would go in hand in hand. Probably other viral infections also cause uh, such kind of uh, a typical tree in bud appearances, like uh, cytomegalovirus. I think that is fairly common, and uh, uh, infectious cause obviously uh, uh, atypical infections might cause. And uh, other uh, at that's times bronchitis uh, is at times yeah bronchitis yes aspiration pneumonitis these things can uh, lead to such type of shadows. I mean uh, cystic fibrosis also is documented, but I'm not putting it because it's, it's an exceedingly rare diagnosis. So, Dr. Bogia, sir, your comments on green bud. This comes up very frequently in the CT reports. Green bud, does it have diagnosis? Uh, yeah. So, so what? Normally, in the Indian scenario, if you see, the most common, it can occur in any of the bacterial, fungal infections you see. But the most of the time, the most common scenario which we see is tuberculosis, as that is a thought because that is probably the most common uh, infection we see in our day-to-day, -day, any uh, chronic infection. So that comes up up front there, but it can occur in whole lot of other conditions as rightly it can be in aspiration it can be in abpa you know patients having abpa can be there it can be a part of rheumatoid lung or yogran syndrome it can sometimes also occur in rarely in uh, you know pulmonary vascular diseases when it is there and uh, fungal infections as i said abpa per se or fungal infections like uh, aspergillus sometimes can cause. So any, uh, you know, uh, 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 chronic infection which cause, causes a cavitation kind of a, a thing in the lung probably can present in th uh, this kind of a setting you know, with a tree in bud on a CT. Yeah. So, so I think the take-home message is that tuberculosis should be thought of, but it is very non-specific. It is not really a diagnostic uh, CT finding and uh, it can be seen in a host of uh, conditions besides tuberculosis. So, uh, anything else? Uh, we, anybody else wants to say or should we move on now? No, I guess we can move on. So, so the differentials right now are that I think uh, we, are, uh, we are dealing with an infection. Malignancy seems unlikely unless that small uh, you know, opacification, which was thought to be consolidation, though there are no air bronchograms in that, whether that is a malignancy, it's still possible. You cannot do it at all together. You know, we can have malignancy with some infection, and uh, we are not sure of those cystic or cavity like uh, spaces, whether they are endon bronchi or whether they are bullae or whether they are cavities or whether they are cysts. So, <clears throat> the differential right now, I think, is between uh, an infectious process. Uh, uh, COPD exacerbation and there can be an underlying malignancy. That is what comes to my mind. And uh, I think with that, we should move forward. So further, the patient underwent a bronchoscopy. 
and the reports were as follows uh, direct afp staining was 3 plus tb gene expert showed high mtb detected with no rifampicin resistance and the routine culture sample also grew nocardia farcinica so this is so just hold it there this is very interesting now that he has both tuberculosis and nocardia and uh, <coughs> the thing is uh, dr ritu comments and dr nikhil sir sir AFP three plus is fine, but uh, nocardia was it grown so fast? Is it? I can understand TB gene expert is really quick, but uh, nocardia takes time to grow. If that is what my understanding is, and uh, regarding AFP three plus, now nocardia can be confusing in the sense that uh, even with atypical mycobacteria or even with uh, nocardia, you do get a positive test. In fact, there's some sort of a specialized test they do. Um, AFP positive. Nocardia is AFP positive. That's what you intend to say. Yeah. One, one thing I would like to say that Nocardia usually, to my knowledge, seems to be in weakened immune system. So we did not get any history or examination or any test. Even the HIV probably was not commented. So no, no, was uh, uh, was uh, well, uh, okay. My time is there. So so if he had uh, maybe malnutrition was the only reason for him to be immune. Suppressed, and that is why it caused nocardia infection. But I don't know. I mean, immunocompetent people. If sir, you or sir would highlight better that uh, nocardia infection is common or not. Nocardia does not grow in lungs just like that. I mean, nocardia in lungs is pretty specific. So specific in uh, immune. Uh, it's more specific in immune sub immune suppressed persons. HIV malignancy. No, reported more commonly. But I mean, more commonly, yes. Reported more commonly, but I mean, in immunocompetent, not seen. Maybe I don't know. Atul sir would be knowing more about the lung. Okay. Can I? Can I add here? Yeah, that's what. That was the most interesting part about this case. Actually, acute respiratory failure kind of a presentation with background or low fever and all that was not very uh, interesting. The interesting thing here is I wanted to just highlight two three things here in this patient. So we tried getting a sputum example done on him, and we could not. Induce that kind of sputum for him, and uh, he was a borderline hypoxic. As he improved a little bit, uh, we went in and did a bronchoscopy on him, and a bronchoscopy, uh, we had the smear saying it was AV three plus, and we do the fungal smear, uh, and we do the smear for the nocardia, and we got that uh, organism resembling nocardia is there. So initially we thought that we were dealing from with nocardia or what is it? But we also at the same time, as rightly, the turnaround time for TB gene expert actually TB gene expert has made life very easy because within few hours you are able to get to know. So this is very very important test in uh, in our day to day practice nowadays. So we got the TB gene expert. So. it was very clear that this patient had mtb because some lot of times we've had seen lot of patients as discussion for uh ntm nocardia we have uh, it is documented and we've seen patients who have background bronchiectasis who have had pulmonary tb in the past who have who have been smokers who have been on steroids they are at higher risk of developing ntm as well as nocardia this patient had a history of steroid intake for a few weeks for his covid probably that was the only immune compromised state apart from him being a smoker and having some amount of emphysema and little bit of bronchiectasis changes in his lung so uh, a smear ab positive and a negative gene expert would have made it clear that whether he has an ntm on him but to our surprise within a few days although the slide shows that culture came in obviously it took couple of days for the culture to grow but uh, nocardia grew while he was in the hospital only that is within uh, 48 to 72 hours our uh, they were able to get the nocardia culture also so probably the load was there and we could get it 
so that was something which was uh, uh, very very fascinating for us that we got both the infections in this patient so, and nocardia we've seen uh, yeah that is right that immunocompromised but a uh, lot of patient as i said who have underlying lung disease who have bronchiectasis who are on steroid uh, they are uh, prone to nocardia and we've seen a uh, lot of nocardia we see probably one nocardia in a month or two uh, so it is not uh, that very rare as we used to think uh, earlier probably with better microbiology backup and uh, suspicion so, so dr atul uh, one uh, thing i would like to add here is that uh, a key point here is all AFP positive is not tuberculosis. One has to yes. think of nocardia, one has to think of NT, and I think uh, there is uh, a bacteria called Rhodococcus equi, which is uh, seen uh, predominantly in HIV patients, uh, maybe seen in a compromise also. These are some of the organisms which can be AFP positive, especially NTM, which is highly present as a common cell in uh, COPD patients or chronic lung disease patients. Uh, other point I want to like to say is that any of these pathogens like nocardia, aspergillosis, though classically they occur in immunocompromised, they do occur even in immunocompetent patients. Uh, we have, I have seen several times, Sir has also quoted that he has seen several times and it is documented in literature. And the final point I want to make is nocardia is also a commensal. Nocardia it can be a commensal in the respiratory tract. And whether he had a dual infection with nocardia, I'm not so sure. Tuberculosis, yes, definitely. I think he definitely had tuberculosis. But whether there was a dual active infection with nocardia or whether nocardia was a commensal here would be a, a, a point for you know debate because uh, double infection would be really uh, quite uh, rare in the absence of immunosuppression, uh, organ transplant, or you know, being on uh, immunosuppressant drugs, it would be rare. Was the PCR done on the bronchial wash for no cardiac? Uh, no, PCR was not done, but we did routinely do a smear and culture, so that was done. Okay, so uh, I think let's move on then. The patient was started on ATT along with Cotramaxazole. His fever spike subsided and he improved symptomatically. After two days of the same treatment, the patient developed altered sensorium and persistent vomiting. Repeat investigation showed a rise in liver function test. He was shifted to the ICU and treatment for hepatic encephalopathy was started and ATT was modified. He improved in four to five days and the patient was eventually shifted to room. His condition improved after one week and is currently doing well on regular follow-up. Uh, Ma'am, can we go back to the last slide? So, uh, after how many days of ADT did he develop altered sensorium? Two days. Two days? Yes. So, I think uh, uh, <coughs> that is unusual for uh, if you are thinking of ATD induced hepatitis, Dr. Bogia said you'd like to clarify this here. That yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, uh, actually, he was a very uh, lean thin person, not able to take orally uh, that much. Uh, and uh, we started him on ATT along with the, uh, uh, the septor cotraxnoxazole. So he had a lot of gastric issues to start with. He had a lot of nausea and uh, vomiting, decrease in appetite. And uh, uh, in fact, three, four days, I would say, was the timeline when he started becoming dull and his liver enzymes became uh, four or five times the normal. And uh, that was the time we uh, uh, worked him up and uh, looked for his ammonia, which was on the higher side. His liver enzymes were high. And... Uh, Probably, uh, we cannot say, but there was no evidence of any underlying liver disease as such. If somebody has an underlying liver disease, they, that can be pre precipitated. He was a non-alcoholic, so that component was uh, probably not there. But generally, he's built and probably he had been unwell for some time, so he probably could not uh, take in the ATT. And on follow-up also, he had a lot of issues. He's not tolerating rapamycin. He had to be off rapamycin all the while, although he has gained... 
around 7 8 kgs of weight and uh, he is better but uh, he is not tolerating the pamphlin the moment you start him on uh, the first line uh, treatment he has a rise in liver and fat so uh, he's had a difficult course but yes uh, it was too early for him to uh, get this symptom generally it is uh, a week or so 5 to 7 days of uh, att is the timeline when we tend to have this kind of side event but in this patient he had a lot of uh, nausea vomiting and all and probably a lot of pill burden because he was getting uh, oral uh, septron so that was also probably causing a lot of gastritis uh, and also sir i think uh, septron or cotrimoxazole as you would call it is also hepatotoxic so th- that yeah. is, uh, that also may have added to the hepatotoxicity and uh, he went into acute liver failure or it was just hepatic encephalopathy i not also no. he was just in uh, became drowsy which was partly contributed to because of hepatic encephalopathy because his ammonia was high and liver enzymes were uh, five times or so five to six times uh, gone up and he became dull and he had a lot of uh, probably a, a component of dehydration also because he had a lot of nausea vomiting associated a lot of gastritis also Uh, along with that so it was a mixed uh, hepatitis gastritis with encephalopathy but no failure his uh, uh, inr remained okay and so okay so uh, dr ritu ma'am any other uh, going into alter sensorium uh, on att apart from you know hepatic encephalopathy have you seen anything which puts patient of it on ATT into order sensorium apart from hepatic encephalopathy not much to contribute from my side dr nicholas any any comments any other causes of order sensorium on ATT no sir i cannot think of that actually uh, two days uh, slightly early in my opinion no yeah uh, anything to do with inh i um, has seen a side effects it can actually uh, throw a, uh, the patient into seizures <coughs> psychosis so <coughs> that is another thing we should think of inh has seen a side effects and uh, it can uh, be something we tend to overlook at times because it is not talked about uh, too much and uh, <coughs> that should always be patient can be developing non convulsive seizures also and uh, one thinks that the patient has actually gone into hepatic encephalopathy So, Dr. Goya sir, for everybody's sake, would you like to talk about ATT induced hepatitis and how to stop it, when to stop it, and when to restart and the regime, etc. Just a small talk on ATT induced hepatitis. Sure. So, ATT induced hepatitis is uh, not something which is uncommon. We see it in close to ten to fifteen percent of our patients, and uh, uh, as you rightly highlighted, all the drugs have their set of uh, side effects apart from hepatitis psychosis seizures which is not unusual with inh as you rightly said but hepatitis being the most common issue which generally i would see we see it uh, after at least 5 to 7 days of antitubercular treatment uh, so four drug standard treatment so the three of the four drugs are hepatotoxic except ethambutol so the general dictum which we follow is Uh, we watch for clinical response clinical uh, side effect this is if the patient is having uh, nausea vomiting and patient is so symptomatic for hepatitis and the patient is symptomatic for hepatitis and uh, the liver enzymes are three times above normal then i would like to stop all hepatotoxic drugs if the patient has no signs and symptoms of hepatitis but the liver enzymes are five times above the normal then also i would like to stop the anti tubercular drug and with like to replace with second line uh, treatment whether it is a quinolone or an injectable amino glycoside till the time i am able to handle the hepatotoxicity that may take a week to two weeks and gradually then restart uh, one by one uh, the hepatotoxic drug uh and watch for the symptomatology as well as the uh, response uh, by way of the liver enzymes and uh, generally most of the patients would uh, settle down in 2 to 4 weeks with this uh, methodology 
but some patients as was this patient generally have a lot of issue uh, especially rifampicin in our indian population we see is the one which is most difficult for them to tolerate in the most common one so that uh, we have to see i think so three times and five times is the figure which generally we follow uh, which we should keep in mind so if it is symptomatic three times you stop asymptomatic even if it is five times and no symptom you stop it and uh, sometimes sir i think even with the vaccine you can have isolated bilirubin and alpha's uh, rise also that is that also if you can test yes yeah. so rifampicin can cause an increase in bilirubin without any increase in the transaminitis uh, and there can be some amount of uh, increase in the alkaline phosphatase gamma gt and uh, sometimes a thrombocytopenia which is quite sinister Uh, and uh, the other thing is, sir, any role for uh, NAC in these patients uh, going into uh, you know new hepatitis? Sometimes it can be a failure uh, also. Uh, NAC. Uh, there are certain papers, and a uh, lot of time we also use, but there is no definitive role as such. NAC is used uh, for as a free radical scavenger in most of these settings. So, but. Uh, Unless and until it's an acute severe hepatic for patients who are outpatient, patient is walking, uh, not. But maybe in the acute setting, uh, can be tried, and uh, sometimes we also use it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that is uh, what I would also say that in uh, paracetamol poisoning, yes, acute liver failure due to paracetamol poisoning is class one evidence. But in acute liver failure. due to other causes is probably indicated only in stage 3 and stage 4 hepatic encephalopathy so that is what the literature says so we have a tendency and i've seen also that any kind of hepatitis occurring people start them on nac there is no real evidence for that and uh, nac is not a panacea for any scotpd going up or bilirubin going up in the icu so there is no real evidence for that So, uh, uh, Dr. Jodi, uh, Dr. Ritu, ma'am, any comments? Dr. Nikhil, sir, any comment from your side? No, oh, sir, nothing. I mean, I believe that uh, only indication is paracetamol use. For all the others, <coughs> the evidence is pretty sketchy. So, probably I would hold back in other indications, but because there is nothing else that actually really works, so that's why it is used as a last resort. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> Dr. Gouria sir, uh, I think that was the last slide, Dr. Shubhra. No, we have a discussion after that. Yeah, please, please. Sir. Now, cardiosis is an acute, subacute, or a chronic infection, infectious disease that occurs in cutaneous, pulmonary, and disseminated forms. It is typically a weekly acid fast after traditional staining, and positive on modified acid fast staining, but this is not invariable. the cutaneous lymphocutaneous and subcutaneous forms of nocardiosis arise from local traumatic inoculation not necessarily associated with immunocompromised host states pleuropulmonary nocardiosis presumably arises from inhalational exposure it produces suppurative uh, necrosis with frequent abscess formation at the site of infection e cell mediated immunity is the principal protective immune response to nocardiosis therefore nocardiosis is uh, is most problematic in individuals with impaired t cell mediated immunity pulmonary nocardiosis occurs as acute subacute or chronic condition clinical manifestations include inflammatory endobronchial masses localized or diffuse pneumonia plus minus cavitations abscess formations pleural effusions and empyema cough with sputum production and fever are the dominant symptoms at least 40% of the patients with disseminated nocardiosis have a pulmonary infection therefore the clinical presentation may be dominated by pulmonary symptoms the general guidelines for treatment treatment guidelines for nocardiosis are hindered by lack of controlled clinical trials of therapy difficult and in the past poorly standardized in vitro susceptibility testing leading to widely disparate reports in uh, reports of in vitro antimicrobial susceptibility 
lack of firm data on correlation of in vitro susceptibility with in vivo therapeutic efficacy the changing taxonomy of the nocardia species coming to the treatment options for isolated cutaneous infections uh, trimethoprim uh, along with sulfamethoxazone 5 to 10 mg k per kg orally is given in two divided doses or minocycline 100 mg orally twice daily for non severe mycetoma the dose of ceftran is 10 mg per kg orally and along with dapson 100 mg orally once daily mild to moderate pulmonary disease and immunocompetent host uh, ceftran 5 to 10 mg per kg orally in divided doses mild to moderate pulmonary disease in immunocompromised host the dose is increased to 15 mg per kg in 2 3 to 4 divided doses in severe infections imipenem 500 mg iv every 6 hourly plus minus amikacin 7.5 mg per kg iv 12 hourly severe pulmonary or disseminated disease uh, ceftran 15 mg per kg iv in 3 to 4 doses plus amikacin 7.5 mg per kg iv every 12 hourly or imipenem 500 mg iv every 6 hourly along with amikacin 7.5 mg per kg iv every 12 hourly when there is involvement of more than two sites in immunocompromised host without cns involvement ceftran 15 mg per kg iv in 3 to 4 doses along with uh, ceftran 15 in sorry there's a like This the there's a misprint. Coming to CNS disease with multi-organ involvement, ceftran 15 mg per kg IV in three to four doses, along with imipenem, along with amikacin. Life-threatening disease, ceftran 15 mg per kg IV in three to four doses, along with imipenem 500 mg per uh, 500 mg IV every six hourly and amikacin 7.5 mg per kg every 12 hours. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Shipra. Uh, very nicely you have made this and presented, and uh, you have taken the time out to make this. Thank you so much. Uh, can you close uh, your uh, share screen? So, Doctor Gogia, sir, would you like to summarize the key points and everything for everybody? yeah just one point about nocardia and the nocardia species so that is also very important now uh, nocardia farsinesa which was grown in this patient actually generally you have to be very sure and these days you need to get susceptibility testing done because uh, it is found to be a resistant kind of a nocardia and the frontline therapy the sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim may not work so luckily for this patient we did get susceptibility and he was uh, susceptible but it is now we have to ensure that there is uh, we have the susceptibility testing for this kind of a thing uh, now going back to the case uh, the case as uh, the key point i what i feel is that in this kind of uh, in a patient who comes in with uh, respiratory symptoms breathlessness fever with the chest finding pulmonary involvement obviously uh, chronic illness tuberculosis remains the key uh, differential uh, in our setting but we have to keep our minds and eye open because a lot of time we are seeing atypical infections it is not only the immunocompromised host but patients who have underlying illnesses patients who have elderly they tend to have non tubercular mycobacteria i have seen lot of people in practice just seeing a sputum afb or a skin you know a lot of these procedures which are being done lot of people are undergoing procedures uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomies i uh, and uh, i just recently had a patient who had a filler and a skin treatment done for face and it was fever and the swelling was there and it turned out on the aspirate to be afb positive so in this setting you have to be ensure this is not tuberculosis this is non tubercular atypical mycobacteria so the treatment is different so we have to keep 
and other infections especially so now that we are going to see a whole lot of post covid patients who been in the icus who been in on steroids and we had an outbreak of mucormycosis but we are seeing a resurgence of tuberculosis the number of tuberculosis ab positive i am seeing now is much higher than what i was seeing a couple of years ago i am seeing 3 plus 2 plus uh, ab positive which i was not seeing so that is another thing we need to keep our eyes and mind open in this kind of a setting then again infections like aspergillus nocardia are also common in this kind of a setting which need to be so it is important that we do a proper culture we get a susceptibility testing done and wherever feasible get a gene expert uh, uh, assay done for uh, patients for us to reach to a, a conclusive diagnosis as uh the treatment depends on that because the treatment may vary depending on what organism you are going so it is very very important thank you uh, absolutely sir absolutely and it also emphasizes the importance of bronchoscopy you know bronchoscopy should be done wherever there is any doubt about the diagnosis and uh, tuberculosis can actually present with ards also once in a while tuberculosis comes as ards and the only way to pick it up is through bronchoscopy that is one of the important uh, features of bronchoscopy that it pick, picks up unusual organisms and you can send the pcr and uh, really make the diagnosis otherwise you are just looking for a needle in the haystack so i think uh, with that uh, we shall come to a conclusion dr nikesh should we conclude absolutely sir i think uh, so dr gogia sir is. and uh, uh, should we conclude now yes surely thank you so much for making it happen thank you thank you everybody and uh, thank the audience and uh, thanks supla pharmaceuticals for digital platform thank you everybody thank you.